it's time to start. It's one o'clock Eastern time, and we're gonna start our session. For those who don't know who I am, my name is Steve Teresi, and I am the Director of Training and Technical Services at JL Audio. I'm located down in Southern Florida, not too far from the factory. Uh, with me today, I have Mr. Kevin Ferry, who's in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Please say hello, Kevin. Hello, everybody. All right, and over in Southern California, I have Mr. Rob Haynes, who will be presenting for us today. Go ahead and say hello, Rob. Good afternoon, everyone. Fantastic. Okay, this session is on our JD amplifiers as an overview on that new product that we have coming out. Or actually, not coming out, it's out. It's in there. It's uh, ready to roll. So um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Rob. Take it away, Rob, if you don't mind. Um, thanks for joining us today, everyone. Uh, Steve mentioned this session is on the new line of JD amplifiers. Uh, if any questions do come up, if you're on WebEx, please utilize the chat. And again, if you're on Facebook watching us, utilize the chat for any questions that you may have. Steve and Kevin are both monitoring them, and they'll be able to answer any questions that may come up. When I'm all done with my spiel on things, um, we'll exit out of the presentation, and I uh, will further open up for any questions that may come up at the end there. So uh, for today, this uh, follows our new uh, online training model of... Uh, Quick and easy. Uh, this is about a 35-40 minute session. We're going to do a quick overview on JD amplifiers. We're going to go through the models in the JD family, some of the key features and technologies, some suggest su blah, 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 suggested applications and systems, and then of course that Q&A uh, at the end if there's anything that wasn't uh, asked or discussed during the presentation itself. So with that said, let's dive into the new line of JD amplifiers. Uh, these are the replacement for the longstanding JX line, which uh, also had a revamp during its uh, original run, going from Class AB to Class D amplifiers. Um, some cool things about the new line of JD amps, like all JL Audio amplifiers, they are designed in Phoenix, Arizona by our extremely talented electrical engineering team there. If you guys aren't aware, in addition to our speaker engineering team in Florida, we house engineering offices in Phoenix and Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon does a lot of our DSP stuff, the stuff you'll find in VXI, MVI, uh, anything software firmware related like Media Master and Bluetooth products. And then the team in Phoenix is our electrical engineering team. They're the guys that are responsible for all of our amplifiers. We have a ridiculously talented team in Phoenix. Uh, somewhere between like four to 500 combined years of electrical engineering experience between our team there. Uh, legendary amp designers like Bruce McMillan or BMAC as we like to call him. Uh, BMAC's responsible for our first slash amplifiers. He's responsible for the original extant amplifiers. And prior to that, he was responsible for the original PPI art series amplifiers. So Bruce is a legend. And we have other legends in the industry as well. Guys responsible for those classic old school amps from Rockford, Phoenix Gold, Orion, you name it. If it was one of those legendary amps back in the 80s, early, mid 90s, those guys work for us now. So we have a very, very talented team. And JD is the newest addition to their uh, portfolio of amplifiers that they've designed for JL Audio. Uh, for me, what's really nice about JD is it is an unbelievable value. I hate calling it entry level because it is our entry level amplifier, but it is far from entry level. And because of that, there's probably a bit of a premium when you look at price compared to other entry level amplifiers, but it's worth it. And we're going to talk about those technologies that make JD a great first amplifier if maybe an RD or XDV2 amp isn't in your budget. And then um, we'll talk a bit about the features and the layout on that. So really, really nice line of new Class D amplifiers. What I really like is the new modern aesthetics. We've kind of kept that same look and feel somewhat from the JX line, but we've really modernized it with a nice smooth chassis top, nice uh, the JD logo in that nice sky blue, and also some pretty cool status indicators on the top of the amplifier chassis. On the left side of every JD amplifier, you'll have your um, essentially your power indicator. When the amp powers on, that light will turn on. And then on the right, we have the uh, oh shoot, something's wrong indicator. Uh, amp goes into thermal protection, or maybe there's a low impedance, high current issue. That will kick on and let you know what's going on. And again, the manual and also the JL Audio Help Center has some insightful um, menu options in terms of what the different LED status indicators mean when they light up on the amplifiers. So that's pretty cool that those are on top. 
makes it a lot easier. For me, I love having stuff on the top. I don't want to have to crank my neck in a trunk to look at the side of an amplifier to see if the, if, if the amp is powered up or if it's in protect. So I think it's really cool having that on the top of the amp. Just makes it a lot easier when you're in a tight space like a trunk or under a seat. On the sides of the amplifiers are where we're going to have our connections. Um, on the, uh, I believe the left side of the amp, we have our power and speaker connections. Very similar to JX, we have um, molded, uh, pretty much plugs that are inserted and molded into the amplifier. And within that, we have a recessed uh, input for our power wire and for the speaker wire on each side of the amplifier. And if you look at the picture, you can kind of see the metal casing that the wire will slide into is recessed a bit from the plastic housing. That helps make sure we don't have any uh, extra copper that may be exposed, provides a clean install, and if you trim your jacket off your power wire just right, you shouldn't see any copper at all and you'll have a nice, tug, uh, nice snug fit with all of your connectors. The other nice thing uh, that we do on our amplifiers on the full range side of things, you'll notice on speaker outputs, we do show you what your connection should be if you're going to bridge channels. So on this JD400-4 here, you'll notice on channels 1 and 2, channel 1 positive and channel 2 negative are kind of connected, if you will, at the top by those dashed lines with bridged in the middle. So if we were to bridge channels on this, all we need to do is connect uh, channel 1 positive to channel 2 negative, and we now have a bridge connection. So those are nicely labeled as well to help simplify the install process and make sure things are done right the first time. On the other side of the amplifier, these are where we're going to get into the controls. And we're going to start with the JD400-4 first, because the monoblocks have a little bit of a different feature set when it comes to controls. Some of the main features for me include uh, the option to pick how many inputs we're using. And this is really handy if you don't have a source unit that has uh, you know, front and rear outputs. Maybe we're using uh, just a Bluetooth adapter like an MBT CRX or MBT RX, or we just have a, a source unit that only has left right audio out. By using a two channel input mode, that means if we only have input coming into RCA inputs one and two, all four outputs will still get that left right signal. Outputs, um, you know, one and three, if you will, will be your left input one signal, and channels uh, two and four would be your right uh, input signal. So if we have all four inputs being used, cool. You just move to that four channel input mode and each input will have its own independent output. Another cool feature on JD is the fact that we have uh, a couple turn on methods. This is very similar to the RD, XD, V2, VXI uh, amplifiers. As more and more cars don't have a dedicated remote turn-on circuit, we're dealing with CAN bus and other data bus type systems in the car, it can be difficult to find a reliable 12 volt turn-on. So if that's the case and the vehicle does not have that, we give you the option to do DC offset or signal sensing. If you are using an aftermarket source unit that has a dedicated remote turn-on trigger or you have a vehicle that has a legit 12 volt turn-on, Use the remote turn on circ or the remote turn on option. It's without a doubt the most reliable way to go. If you don't have that, that's where the benefit of DC offset and signal sensing come in. And I'll explain to you how those work. When you're using DC offset, whether it's an aftermarket or a, uh, a factory amplifier, or a source unit, or even though it's AC signal that leaves the amplifier, that's essentially the music, if you will. That's going from the source to the amp to get boosted and go to the speakers. There's always a little bit of offset DC that goes with it as well. So even though AC is the, is the music, if you will, there's always a little bit of DC on that line as well. And when those analog inputs receive that DC signal, that will turn the amplifier on. Likewise, when the DC goes away, it'll tell the amplifier to turn off. Signal sensing uses AC signal, so the music, if you will. When it detects AC voltage coming through those RCA inputs, it turns the amp off. When it doesn't detect voltage, it'll turn, it'll turn the amp on, and when it doesn't detect voltage, it'll turn the amp off. I prefer to use DC offset out of those two, only because if you turn the, vol the, maybe you turn the radio down, you're having a conversation in the car to a low volume, or kids are sleeping in the back, or whatever the case may be. 
If there's not enough voltage on the inputs, the amplifier will turn off. Well, that's not the end of the world. You turn the volume back up, it'll wake up, but it might not be as fast as you want. As long as that factory amp is on, or the source unit's on, there's going to be DC still exiting it, even though that it's a low AC voltage. So for me, I find DC offset a little more reliable when it comes to keeping the amp on because it's more likely to be there, especially at lower volumes where AC voltage may not be enough to uh, make the amp uh, want to stay on for you. Additionally, we have low and high input voltage switches. One of the other nice new features on JD is that we utilize differential balanced inputs. Um, these uh, allow us to help further mitigate noise related issues in the car. The, ra the way they focus on the center pin of the RCA and the ground shielding and helps prevent any uh, unnecessary noise. Of course, please make sure your wires are run properly. That's always the best way to make sure we don't have a noisy system. But differential balance inputs help uh, further prevent that. In addition to that, we're using a high voltage input. So like RD and XDV2, we can send up to 8 volts of AC signal directly into these. So if we have anything higher than two, three volts, you'll want to actually use that high voltage switch and you can run your RCAs directly in. So no more Molex plug like the JX had if we we're using a high level signal. For me, this is great when you're doing a simplified installation into an OEM system. Maybe we're just adding a subwoofer and we have a factory sub signal we can work with or a rear speaker signal we can work with. If it's under 8 volts, if it's in the frequency uh, bandwidth you want, all you need to do is utilize some speaker wired RCA adapters, get those in line with the signal, and you can plug it straight into the amplifier. You don't need uh, a line output converter or another device to step the signal down because these will accept up to 8 volts of signal, which outside of more in-depth crazy OEM integration options, for a basic vehicle, these you should be able to use the factory signal anytime. If you are maybe saying adding a subwoofer or you're using these with factory signal that exceeds 8 volts, that's where that cool LOC22 comes into play. We can put that in front of the amplifier, lower the voltage from the factory amp to a safe input voltage that the JD amp can accept. Going on to the crossover side of things, you'll notice on the JD400-4 we do have two uh, filter options because this is a 4 channel amplifier. So you have the option to do either high pass or low pass filters for each pair of channels. You have your adjustable, uh, your potentiometer there to adjust the frequency that you want the um, filters to start at. And then of course there, next to it is the input sensitivity potentiometer, but we're going to get into that in just a bit because there's something really cool about that input sensitivity pot. Additionally, next to those uh, inputs, by the way, we do have a pair of pre-outs as well. This allows us to take whatever's coming into channels one and two on the input side and we can pass it through to another amplifier. So if we had maybe two, uh, a JD400-4 and then you have a mono block after that, we can take that signal and pass it through to the other amplifier instead of using Y adapters if your source unit didn't have enough outputs for a six channel system. So nice little feature built into the JDs as well. On the mono block side, a uh, couple changes. Uh, we only do a low pass filter, obviously, being mono blocks are going to be for subwoofers only. We still have the, the turn on methods. We still have that high input voltage option and the pre out. What's really going to differentiate the mono blocks is the base boost option. We can, you can add up to 12 dB of boost on the output side of things. I always stress, please be careful when you boost. And if you're going to boost after your input sensitivity has been set, you may want to readdress, uh, readdress input sensitivity. You have to remember, input sensitivity... Huh? Say what again, Steve? Instead of drink responsibly, it's boost responsibly. Huh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, remember, input sensitivity, is it, it's not a volume knob. It's saying, based off of the strength of the signal coming into the amplifier, how sensitive do I need to be for the amplifier to hit its max output? So if we set it and we have a perfectly set input sensitivity, but then we add boost, well, now there's even more power leaving the amplifier. So we probably would want to lower the input sensitivity to balance that new boosted output. So it's really saying, how, how sensitive am I to hit my max output? And if we boost, we need less of a stronger input signal. So if you set it right and then add boost, there's a very good chance that you could start clipping 
I know you're not trying if you're not clipping. A little clipping is good on subs, but when we start adding boost, you can get into heavy clipping, and that's what's going to cause speakers to get damaged. That's where you get into melted voice coils, speakers moving too much, and having mechanical failure. So just be smart if you are going to use the bass boost. Additionally, we have a um, uh, input for our RBC1 level controller. This is going to be an attenuation knob. It is not a boost knob. That's what's built into the amplifier. So with the RBC1, essentially we have the option to turn the subwoofers down. So when plugged in and the RBC1 is at full tilt boogie, turned all the way up, we are essentially at where the source unit is. And then as we turn the knob down, it will attenuate the subwoofers relative to where the source unit's master volume is. So master volume, subs will track up and down with it. And then from there, we can lower the subwoofers from the master volume as needed. So that's how that works. It's not a boost. It's essentially, essentially an attenuator from where the source unit is at. Um, I find most of the time that thing's full tilt because he wants to turn their subs down. <laughs> so now we kind of... Full tilt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so now we kind of covered some of the basic controls on the JD side. Let's get into the different models that we uh, have for you. Uh, it's a really nice family. Again, great for those starter systems, um, if you will. We have the JD 400 slash 4. It's a four channel, 400 watt Class D full range amplifier. If I remember correctly, at four ohms, it's four by 75. I think I'm terrible with specs. Steve's no good. Key yeah, fit is four by seventy-five oh. and then a hundred by four, um, or you can bridge it for two hundred uh, by two. So perfect. Thank you, guys. And then we have a nice family of mono blocks, uh, anywhere from two hundred fifty watts to a thousand watts. Um, so three models there. Those ratings, of course, are at uh, two ohm load. So um, you know, pretty much anything you would need mono block wise. Uh, again, for a, a, start, a starting base package or a, a budget base system, again, if XD or RD may not be uh, 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 an affordable option, but a very, very nice lineup right there. But let's get into the key features now. <clears throat> this for me, I, we, our team that when, when they came out with the JD line, um, I was actually shocked uh, that we were able to get all of these features uh, into the JD price point. Because um, they share a lot of the technologies, actually, that you find in RD, XD, V2, HD, VXI. Um, so they are very feature-packed. So uh, we'll break down each of these technologies and why they're important. But what you're going to find in the JD family is our next D switching technology. Automatic turn-on capabilities, which we've already discussed. Those differential, differential balanced inputs. An easy-to-use clipping indicator. Uh, 12 dB per octave crossovers. And then, of course, on the mono blocks, you have a bass boost EQ and level control with that RBC1. So let's dive into these technologies. Uh, next D switching. Um, this is a really key technology for JL Audio. Uh, this first came out with the original line of XD amplifiers, of course, now found in XD V2, RD, MX, and now the uh, JD line. And what it does is it ramps up the switching frequency of the Class D amplifier. Um, a good analogy, if you don't know how Class D amplifiers work, I know the D is not for digital, it's just the next letter in line, Class A, Class B, C, D. But we call them switching amplifiers because essentially they're turning on and off. Um, I was, you know, if you think of, of byproducts of something being on, it's heat. So think about an old school light bulb. You turn the light switch on, that old school light bulb turns on and it stays on as long as that switch is on, which means it's always pulling power, there's always current flowing, and a byproduct of that is heat. That's why it gets hot. You know, a toaster, for example, when you turn the toaster on, the, the byproduct of the coils in there is heat. So not super efficient. Well, maybe for a toaster, because we want that. But the more something's on, the more heat it's going to generate. It's also going to pull more current. And we have to remember a lot of these vehicles now have rather delicate charging systems. So what a Class D amplifier is going to do is, let's say we go back to that light bulb real quick. If you could turn that light switch on and off so fast that you could not see the light turning off, it's essentially working the same functionality wise. You're not seeing any change from it turning on and off super fast. 
But since it's not permanently on, it's using less power, it's pulling less current, it's generating less heat because of all of that off time. And that's essentially class D amps. Of course, there's other technologies involved as well to make sure the music plays properly, but that's the fundamental. And with next D switching technology, when we say our amps on a full range model switch at 400 kilohertz, it means you're switching on and off 400,000 times a second. All of that off time is what allows us to make these amps smaller. That's why they generate less heat. It's why they're friendlier on the charging systems because they're not requiring as much current because there's considerably more off time. So going from class D to a, a next D switching frequency further improves what class D amplifiers have already brought to the mix. And of course, it's been ramped up even more with the new next D2 found on VXI and MVI products. So really, really nice for those um, vehicles where you may not have the most robust alternator, you don't have a lot of ventilation or cooling. It does help cool it down and make them a little more friendly. We already talked about the automatic turn on capabilities, but again, you have the option to do a DC uh, uh, offset or a 12 volt turn on trigger, DC offset, and the signal sensing. Again, if the car has an option, whether it's on an aftermarket source unit or in the vehicle for a true 12 volt turn on, use that remote turn on trigger. If you don't have that option, DC offset is usually my preferred option. But if maybe you're having issues with that, you have the AC um, signal sensing option as well through those RCA uh, inputs. And speaking of RCA inputs, uh, the dual range differential balance inputs, we talked about those again already, uh, really helps improve uh, mitigating noise in the installation. Obviously, we want to make sure we have our grounds done properly. Don't cross power wire with your signal wires. You know, common installation practices still need to be done to make sure we don't have noise. But differential balance inputs will help further fight any potential noise that may come through uh, the RCAs. Um, you don't typically find these on a lot of entry level amplifiers because they're not an inexpensive part. They are considerably more expensive than, than a normal RCA analog input. So for me, that's a testament of JL Audio. You know, I've had people say, oh, but JD is more expensive than other entry level. Yes, it is. But it's also a premium entry level, if you will. You know, the research I've done at the price points JD are at, I haven't seen the complete feature set that JD has. Differential balance inputs, high input voltage options, uh, you know, three turn on options. I mean, these are feature packed amplifiers. And uh, the fact that we were able to do all of this um, at the JD price point blows me away. But for me, again, these inputs, it's a testament of it for JL Audio. If we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. We know we're not the least expensive brand out there. But if you get a JL Audio product, you know it's going to work, you know it's going to sound great, and that's really, for us, what it's all about at the end of the day, is building the best possible product we can, no matter what the price point may be. Oh, the cool feature on JD is the new LED clipping indicator. This is very similar to the clipping indicator found on the RD family, except it is now actually built around the input sensitivity potentiometer. So what you'll see here is to set levels with JD, same with RD, disconnect your speakers from the amplifier. And what we recommend is you play a frequency specific sine wave, uh, one kilohertz if you're on uh, the uh, 400 slash four, 50 hertz if you're doing the mono blocks. Turn your source unit to three quarter volume. That's usually a good starting point. Slowly turn up that input sensitivity dial. And I say slowly because once that LED kicks on, you stop. And when you do that, you're at your max non-clipped output voltage. It's easy to use, but most for, what's important for me is it's consistent every single time. Um, a few years back in Vegas when we came out with the RD amplifiers, we had a cool demo in our suite at the Palms where we had an RD 500 slash one on a bench hooked up to a picoscope, which is a, a PC-based oscilloscope. And we had a sine wave going into the JD500 or the RD500 slash one. And when you would start to turn up the potentiometer on that RD, you would see the sine wave on the scope get bigger and bigger and bigger. And when that light kicked on, you had a nice big sine wave, nice perfect wave. But if you kept started, if you kept turning the input sensitivity dial, then you would start to see that sine wave on the scope start to square off and it actually showed that we were clipping. So when the light kicked on, we had a perfect wave. 
If we kept turning it after that, we would actually see clipping on the oscilloscope from the outputs of the amplifier. So for me, this is quick, it's easy, and it's consistent every single time. You will always have proper input uh, sensitivity, which again, how sensitive is it to make sure we get maximum output potential without overly clipping and potentially damaging speakers and causing poor sound. So that's a nice feature on the JD. We already talked about the crossovers. Uh, we use 12, D, 12 dB per octave uh, uh, filters for our low pass and high pass uh, filters on, our, uh, on the amplifiers. Again, on the 400 slash 4, you have the option to do um, high pass or low pass. And of course, low pass only on the mono blocks being there for subwoofers only. Again, the base boost EQ, we have up to 12 dB of boost. And again, the uh, port for the uh, optional RBC1. That does not come with the JDs. It is a separate piece. And again, it's an attenuation control. The boost is in the amp. This will essentially allow you to turn down the subwoofers relative to where the source unit's uh, master volume is currently set at. We're getting a couple questions on the uh, Facebook page um, of how exactly um, the controller works and also what the center frequency. The center frequency is 45 hertz for the bass boost of the amplifier itself. But um, there's some confusion on the, re the remote level control working on the outputs rather than interfacing with the input sensitivity being set also. So if you can just explain to us how that uh, is attenuating the output side of the, uh, the base boost and not really messing with your input sensitivity, that'd be great. Yeah, so uh, that's actually a really good question. Um, if you have an RBC1 or any type of base knob uh, in the vehicle, uh, it's our recommendation on training and tech support that when you set input sensitivity, you have it up all the way at full tilt because that's, that's a worst case scenario. If you had, you mean the, the level control, not the input sensitivity. Right, the RBC one should be up all the way. Okay. If you know, <laughs> if, a little weird. <laughs> yeah, if you had it, made, let's say you had it at twenty five percent, you set your input sensitivity and then you crank it up. Well, now we have far exceeded the output potential of the amplifier based on what's coming in. That's where that, like, it's just like with the boost I talked about. You know, when you're setting your levels, your base knob should be up all the way because that's a worst case scenario. We're not gonna further increase and add any clipping. So when setting input sensitivity, disconnect your speakers. If you have a bass knob, that's an attenuating knob. Make sure that's up all the way. If it's a boost type knob, I would figure out a safe place you wanna be in, set your levels, and if you need to lower with a boost after the fact, do it. But um, essentially what the, the level controllers do is they are, they are lowering the output of the, the amp. It's like a volume knob, if you will. So when setting levels, you want it up all the way. That way we have, we, we make sure we're not gonna over clip. And essentially it's just turning down the outputs when needed. That doesn't affect the input in terms of what's coming in. Uh, you know, if you were going to turn it to a certain level and then tuck it away and never use it again, Maybe then I would readdress input sensitivity, but if it's something that's being used all the time, turn it up all the way to get your level set, and then it's just a, a volume controller, if you will, for uh, for the speaker output on those mono block amplifiers. That work? Yes? No? Steve? Kevin? Thumbs up. Okay. Let's give the thumbs up. Perfect. All right. So let's get into some quick um, JD system amplifier ideas. Um, just some good solid starting points where JD uh, really works. Um, some solid systems we've seen that work really nice. Again, uh, this is a great starter system. This will also work nice with other products as well, but a pair of uh, JD amps, a 400 slash four and a 500 slash one on uh, you know our CP108 or CP208 enclosures, the micro subs. Uh, the, the TW1 uh, CP110 and 112 enclosures, the W0 Power Wedge enclosures, all really nice subwoofer systems that can pair nicely with the JD. Even like a W3 or TW3 uh, subwoofers will pair nice. Obviously, you know, if, if it's a bit of a budget system, C1s, really efficient drivers on deck power sound even better when you amplify them. And again, even C2 or C3, C5, those will all sound really nice on the JD amps. Um, you know, 
like I said, while JD is an entry level amp for us, it's not entry level. Uh, this is a phenomenal sounding amplifier designed by some of the best guys in the business. So um, as I said, if it's a JL Audio amp, you know it's going to sound great. So even at uh, this lower price point that JD may fall into, it is a high performance amp. And higher level speakers like C3, C5s, they will sound really, really nice on, uh, on JD. Another uh, nice system, this is a cool setup. You know, everyone, now that we have mono blocks, everyone forgets about like the old three channel, the old school system where you would take a four channel, power a pair of speakers. Again, in this case, you know, we have some C1s, but you could do C2, C3, C5 components or co uh, coaxials and then bridge the other pair of channels for a small subwoofer system like a CP108 or one of those CP110s. Again, this would be a great system for like a single cab pickup truck, old school like an El Camino or Hot Rod where there's not a lot of cabin space inside the vehicle. But some really good uh, you know, ideas to start with when it comes to um, JD amplifiers. Uh, because- It's a really cool starter system you laid out there, Rob. That, that, that subwoofer box is amazingly powerful and with the kind of power that you'll get to those C1650s, if, if you got someone that wants to really get into this and not like go crazy, that's a great thing to do. And if you did want to expand on it, you could keep that four channel amp, add a set of rear speakers and power up the sub with another amplifier. You don't lose anything. It's a great way of building without like discarding anything. So I love systems like that because they'll shock people with their performance. And you, again, you could just build on it as time goes on. There's no reason not to consider that. So, you know, um, again, you know, don't let the price point fool you guys. JD, it's a phenomenal value, phenomenal performance. And, uh, you know, I think for the feature set that it comes with, it, it's a steal, um, especially being it's designed by the guys that are responsible for VXI, HD. This is a real deal amplifier, a killer price and a phenomenal value uh, for anyone that's using it. Um, I know some of our beta testers that were using it before we uh, initially came out with it, the, the rave reviews about the sound quality, especially on that 400 slash 4. So, of course, uh, any further support you guys may need from us, um, please make sure you visit the JL Audio Help Center. There's a lot of good information on there. Um, installation practices, level setting practices, if uh, you don't remember what we discussed about how to set levels on the JD amplifier. There's an article that talks about level setting and it also includes JD and RD amplifiers in that since they have the clipping indicator. Um, so a lot of good stuff on there. Uh, please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, we have started uh, some new videos called Two Minute Tech Tips. And uh, kind of what we're trying to do is give you a, a two minute video on a specific subject. Uh, Kevin recently had his first video um, put up there a week or so ago. And it's, it's about the difference between Linkwitz Riley and Butterworth filters. So quick and easy. What do you get when you use Linkwitz Riley? What do you get when you use a Butterworth filter? Done. So we're going to provide a lot more of those, just quick technical tidbits, quick, quick you know, setup videos for VXI or installation practices. So make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out those new two-minute tech tips that are in the works. And, of course, you can always contact our very talented tech support team. Um, we have some of the best in the business. They're ex-installers, ex-salesmen, they, they live, enthusiasts, they live and breathe 12 volt. Um, you can of course reach them on the JL Audio website um, by either clicking the help icon at the bottom of the page. You can uh, do it through the help center, click support to go to the help center, jlaudio.com, and there's a submit a request link at the top. You can email them or you can call the number if you wanna to talk to them directly, but they're very talented. And not just for troubleshooting, if you have questions about system design, what are good speakers to use with a JD amplifier? What's a good setup to use? This or that. They love talking audio. They love system design. They love helping people choose the products to put in their vehicles because they're enthusiasts just like you guys are. They'll design enclosures for you. So make sure you take advantage of them uh, if you can. And with that, I'm done. So I'm going to close out my keynote. And if we have any other questions, we can uh, handle those now. Excellent, awesome job, Rob. Thank you for the coverage on that. Uh, went really well, I think. So there, you, you answered most of the questions that I saw show up, unless maybe I missed something. So uh, I can see if I see anything. 
We did get a question about the main differences between XD and uh, and JD. Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, it's definitely a question that comes up a lot, and I see where there's confusion. Um, obviously, as we've discussed, JD, RD, XV2, for the most part, share a lot of features and technologies. You have differential balance inputs, you've got the three turn-on methods, you have NextD. Um, there are some differences though. Obviously since these amps have different price points, they are going to have uh, RD and XD are going to have more expensive materials in them. Um, you know, Obviously that means we are going to have a little bit better sonic performance. JD sounds great, RD will sound better, XDV2 will sound better because they do have more expensive, higher quality components inside. Not to say JD doesn't have high quality components in it, but those more expensive models, they're going to be a step or two above because of the price point. Additionally, you got to remember, uh, JD being that all of your connection points are on the sides of the chassis, that also helps bring cost down a bit. A single edge connection point or a single casting like an RD or XD amplifier, that does make it a little more expensive as well. But there's also benefits to that single casting. It's a massive heat sink now, which further pulls more heat off the circuit board. I know these amps are efficient, but they still are going to create heat, especially inside. So a larger single casting, which does cost more money, is also going to help improve the cooling of the amplifier, which in the long run typically helps improve reliability. So you are going to find more expensive materials. You will get a little better performance out of RD and then XD over RD. So I get where there's confusion because of the technologies, but it's the materials that make those technologies happen that really make the difference in price, and you will see that on the performance side as well. So I see Jim has a question saying that if you set levels with, without the RBC1 plugged in, would the RBC1 take it to a higher level or attenuate it only? It would attenuate it only. If there is no RBC1 plugged in, it's the same as an RBC1 turned up all the way. So like I said, when the RBC1 is turned up all the way, you're essentially at whatever the source unit is at. It's a relative attenuation to that. So whether there's no RBC1 or an RBC1 turned up all the way, whatever the source unit is, is what you have coming out of the amplifier. So you could set levels with no RBC1 and then later plug in an RBC1 and you shouldn't have to revisit your levels because at full tilt, it would be the same as if it wasn't part of the mix. See, there's a question about what are the best amps for factory integration other than VXI? Um, you can do some integration with VXI, but I'm a firm believer you should always have a correction device in front. Um, like I said, if we're just utilizing, if we're utilizing a basic full range signal or something that's within the pass band that the amplifier needs that's not heavily EQ'd, doesn't have you know all sorts of crazy stuff, you can pump those into any of our amplifiers as long as it's under 8 volts, um, 16 volts on VXI. But if you have anything where you have like a Bose system or a Sony or you know, a, a B&W in, in a BMW, whatever the case may be, if it's chopped up signal, you're going to want to use some sort of integration device like the Fix or a preamp piece from NavTV, PAC, or those other companies to correct the signal, give you a flat, time-coherent, full-range response, and then send that into the amplifier. So you can do some correction with VXI, but you should always try to use a true integration device that will give you that perfect, flat electrical response. Then you can go in and make your adjustments, and it just makes the whole setup and tuning process a lot easier that way.